Let's take a look at uh, stories making headlines in the media from around the world. And we begin with the Financial Times, which shows a photo of New Zealand's Prime Minister, Jacinda Ardern, embracing a worshipper at a mosque in Wellington, alongside the news that security services in the country face questions on how the attacker was able to acquire weapons. The New Zealand Herald Online in its editorial section says New Zealand must follow the German example and fine Facebook for failing to remove the live stream of the gun attack. Brexit continues to dominate many of the front pages here in the UK, including the Daily Telegraph. The former Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson, in his weekly column, calls on Eurosceptic MPs to reject the Prime Minister's Brexit deal, saying it would give the EU quote, an indefinite means of blackmail against the UK. The international edition of the New York Times says after the Ethiopian Airlines and Lion Air crashes, the focus is now on pilot training. The paper says that Boeing believed pilots of an earlier model of the plane didn't need additional simulator training and were given lessons on an iPad. And the Times carries an image from Saturday's protests of an anti-austerity protester on the Champs-Élysées in Paris, proclaiming that President Macron poses a grave danger to France's health. And finally, BBC Online, our own website, reporting that women are now better represented in film and theatre, according to the acclaimed playwright and director, Sir David Hare. So let's begin. And with me is Stephanie Hare, an independent research analyst. Stephanie, good to, to have you with us. Uh, so uh, let's start with the latest developments uh, from New Zealand and um, uh, the Prime Minister announcing that the gun laws will change. They seem to be moving fairly rapidly on this. Yes, and it's such a striking contrast with the United States where, of course, we're used to so many shootings and nothing happens within Congress because of the powerful National Rifle Association lobby in New Zealand, they're taking an approach that's much more akin to that of Australia, which after a massacre just bans guns and they had a big gun amnesty. So it can be done if there's political will. And I mean, the, uh, there has been, um, I think, quite a lot of um, praise and admiration for the way that Jacinda Ardern has, has provided leadership in the days after this attack. Yeah. I mean, she's shown an incredible human touch and compassion in her leadership style as she's gone and she's promised to cover the costs of the funerals and to help the families as they you know, move on with their lives and she's taking very swift action on the gun laws within New Zealand and they might even be looking at the social media laws. Let's move on to that actually because that has been a very uh, big factor in these attacks, the, the role that social media has played and um, I, I just wanted you do you think that the, the fact people can get this notoriety and can get, uh, you know, the, the fact that the horrific footage can be shared so quickly and so easily perhaps leads people to be more likely to do this kind of thing? I mean, it certainly makes us question whether or not being able to, you know, live stream footage, is that some sort of human right or can we pull that product back until the tech companies are able to demonstrate that they really can take down content that mm. is questionable um, you know, in an emergency situation. Nobody's suggesting that censorship and free speech are at stake here. I think everyone can agree that mm. this particular type of video is not a free speech issue. So I think you're right to raise the point that unless that question is answered, we could certainly see further abuses of a tool. But the difficulty for the, the tech companies is that by its nature, if you're going to have live streaming, mm -hmm. it's not like moderating video clips that are put up. Yeah. It's, it's another layer of difficulty and complexity, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, everyone was sort of questioning why was it so difficult to take it down. And the fact of the matter is, when you're doing a, a sort of artificial intelligence solution to moderate videos like that, you have to deal with multiple people talking at the same time, slang, there's cultural context. It's really difficult to pick that stuff up. It's not the same as scanning photographs, for instance. So once they created the hash for the video, if somebody had simply just altered the video even slightly, edited it, filmed the video on their phone and then reposted that, that's not going to get picked up. So. It's great that Facebook was able to take 1.5 million copies down within 24 hours, but the damage was done probably within the first hour. And, and where is the balance, do you think, between the role that the, the tech companies that operate these, these platforms have to play compared with the role that users have to play and the responsibility that we as users have to 
to, you know, to, to make sure these things don't get inadvertently shared? I think it would be great if we lived in a world where users all had good manners and kindness and courtesy, but I think we live in the real world and therefore technologists have to design technology so that it cannot be abused. Mm. Well, so yeah, a very difficult question for our times, but um, let's, uh, let's move on to another story that's dominating the papers in the UK and that <laughs> is Brexit once again. Talk that, uh, yes. uh, well, the, the finance minister, Philip Hammond, said over the weekend that the deal will only be put before Parliament again for a third time if the government is sure that it has the votes to get it through, to get it approved. Mm. On, the other heart, on the other side of things, Boris Johnson, the former Foreign Secretary, urging MPs to reject it. Yeah. Boris Johnson would be very happy to see the United Kingdom leave the European Union without a deal at all. He doesn't like the Prime Minister's deal. He doesn't want to have to go back and renegotiate it. And he is... He's thinking that somehow if the Prime Minister just goes to the EU summit on Thursday and seeks to renegotiate the backstop again, that they, she'll somehow get better terms. We have seen no indication of that. So now what we're really looking for is to see whether or not the 10 DUP MPs from Northern Ireland, if they come on side, that's what Theresa May needs to get this deal through. If those 10 M MPs come on side, the really sort of right-wing people in her party, the hardcore Brexiteers, will likely follow and she will get her deal passed. Whether that happens before the summit or next week after, that's in question. But the real power play is those 10 MPs. And just to clarify for our international viewers, the DUP is that group of, of Northern Irish MPs that the Prime Minister relies on to have a majority in Parliament. Exactly. And that's why they are so crucial in her getting uh, mm. the deal through. Uh, there was talk at one point that they want, as, as their price for that, uh, a seat at the table uh, when the next, the, the longer term trade negotiations happen. And so things moving uh, very, you know, very rapidly on that. And we'll see where, where we are at the end of the week. Yeah. Uh, compared to, to where we were on Friday. Um, New York Times, um, focusing on these, these tragic plane crashes, the, the Ethiopian Airlines one, and um, th this, this almost seems that it beggars belief that pilots were being trained on an iPad. Yes, there have been questions raised in the United States about whether or not Boeing, the company that manufactures these planes, was being allowed to sort of mark its own homework by the Federal Aviation Authority and therefore they didn't make it so that pilots had to actually go through flight simulator training on this particular model. So there's a real question in play as to whether or not that's, that's negligence and that people were allowed to fly a plane, they weren't capable of dealing with the software changes and issues and as a result we've had these two tragic crashes. And yet there were, there were reports around that in the, the earlier crash, the Lion Air one, the pilots were actually repeatedly trying to switch off the automated system that kept forcing the plane's nose down yeah. because it thought the plane was stalling. And so you've got, you know, you've got human intervention against machines yeah. and the machines prevailed. I mean, this is the sort of nightmare again of sort of humans and technology is in a crisis situation, in an emergency situation, do you want human beings to ultimately have the final say? Um, let's turn to the Times. Uh, another weekend of protests on the streets of Paris and the anger uh, among these protesters, the Yellow Vest movement, uh, the anger against President Macron and his economic policies just seems to grow. Mm. What's important to remember here, though, is that the protests we just saw on the weekend were certainly the most violent that we've seen yet, but there are actually fewer protesters. So there are divisions even within the Yellow Vest movement as to about what is it that they actually want? Why is Macron the problem? And really, what can he do to forestall this level of anger? He's been on a listening tour now for two months, trying to talk with people, find out what they want, what can they do to make things better? Clearly that's not working, but there's also a risk that there are some hardliners here who are just getting a lot of press because they're trashing the Champs-Élysées, which is, of course, the sort of richest area in mm. Paris. I'm sure we'll talk about the uh, Yellow Vest protests uh, again uh, in the near future, but there's, um, there's one that I'm really uh, interesting picked out from on, uh, BBC Online. Sir David Hare, the playwright, saying that um, there's better representation of women in the film and theatre industries now, but still not enough. Yes, and what was also really interesting is how he says this is not coming from the industry itself. It's a, re a reflection of the push from society. It's no longer acceptable to have so few female directors, so few female crew members and screenwriters. 
we can't really live in a world where women are just simply aping the words of men. That We need to see women helping to make the stories, direct the stories and have agency in the stories. I suppose the challenge is how, how do you encourage women to see those industries as ones that are uh, ones that they can realistically uh, achieve the highest levels in if yeah. up till now that's seemed closed off. I think the industry has to say there's room for them at the table and make an effort to do that. Okay. Um, Stephanie, thanks very much indeed. Thank and uh, if you want to have a look uh, in more detail at that article, the uh, interview with Sir David Hare, uh, you can find it on the website. Just go to bbc.com uh, slash news. Stephanie, thanks very much.